Hi. Um, my name is Bob Mushiri. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. And um, I run a collective for. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I run an art collective that's called Studio Art back in Nairobi. And um, I'm used mostly to. I'm always in, uh, behind the camera, so I'll make it very short and quick. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, this project that I'm going to show you is a short film that we made that's called Kichoteni. And um, uh, I'm going to just uh, give you a short talk about uh, how it happened. Um, it's a project where the Gote um, Institute in Nairobi did a project mm. with um, the Gote Institute in Berlin. And they did a project called Berlin B, which is Berlin Nairobi. They got electronic musicians, um, mode selector, Takeman Brothers, and uh, Jacuzzi um, to play, come and uh, do an album with just a band. Um, some guys used to do hip hop in the 90s called Momau, Okoflani. And later, they commissioned different directors or experimental directors to work on the videos. So by that time, I used to work in, a, in advertising and animation. And um, within that field, I had met a lot of people who are, I, I discovered an underground collective of artists. Um, so I had wanted to work with them a lot. And that um, when we were commissioned to come and work on this project, um, we, we got them together. And I'm going to show you what we came up with. And then I'm going to give a short talk about um, what you're working on at the moment. Okay. So, um, I made this film in 2008 um, as a, I, again, as a part of that project called NLP. And um, it served as a very good calling card for our work. Um, so, we set up a, a studio that was Studio Earn because we found out that um, it was a very, very low budget. We, it was like um, in Rand, 100 Rand. Yeah? No, is it 100 Rand? Okay. A thousand dollars, I think it's easier. Yeah. So we did it, and um, we found out that there was a very small collective that were able to do stuff for a very low budget, but be able to achieve um, also test. Because there was there wasn't very many people doing like compositing or um, tracking or any animation. So we were able to come up with small, a low budget project that will test these techniques and also uh, grow a pool of talent. So we ended up working in advertising for like a few years and we've been working on both um, NGO and commercial projects. But um, the Goat Institute approached us now last year and they wanted us to push these projects further. And now we're, the reason I'm here is because um, we're working on a, an installation where we've been collecting these old stories um, from the, we found out that there was a generation that was Passing, especially in Africa, and um, guys were in their 80s, 90s, and that, and they were going away with very important information. So we started recording that, and as we were recording, we found it wasn't just about getting those facts, but there was a lot of poetry and a lot of songs that we found that some of them were acting as compasses for back in the day. So we found it would be really good to find a way to, um, that was, uh, in most of the stories that we were telling, were very direct, there wasn't much of the interactivity or the call and response that our grannies or the, our ancestors' stories had. And um, doing installations and finding ways where we can create um, ways to match these mediums and platforms using transmedia. We found it, it's a very good way to try. And so we don't have much of gaming and much of experimentation happening in Nairobi. So I came to this because uh, of Tegan, she invited me and uh, the Goat Institute and all to come and learn more about um, the gaming industry and see ways that we can be able to push further. Um, and I'm very glad that I've been able to meet a couple of people who we should be able to work together in, the, in our upcoming installation. Thanks. If there are questions, no. Okay, I might sound like an idiot here. When you said it was a thousand dollars, was that sorry, is that US dollars? Or? Yeah, US dollars. US dollars. Wow. I think you had said a thousand dollars. Yeah. How many US dollars? A thousand US dollars. Wow, that's very impressive. 
Thank you. We were, we were at the Tetra Fix party and he was um, talking about the sort of interactive installations that the students had put up there and how sort of very, very basic um, kind of physical interactive environments don't seem to not have narrative in them. There's like a missing quality in narrative and it's all about activity and not about narrative. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more. Um, yeah, we were talking yesterday, uh, I think the, we were discussing about how um, we, we grew up on comic and science fiction and stories and we found that back in the days in the 40s, 50s, 60s, a lot of American or West science fiction stories predicted or they had this um, optimism, op optimism in terms of they predict a, a brighter future. Sorry, this but, but, but you're, you're, not, you're not in the camera. Uh, yeah, I have so. issues with light. Yeah. Sorry, so we were just talking about how the light, uh, not the light, but... <laughs> so uh, I was saying how um, science fiction back in the day used to project a brighter future and it was, well, we used technology um, if it, uh, efficiently in many ways, but nowadays when you look at science fiction, there's hardly much of that doctrine is very dark and post-apocalyptic and we're wondering is there a way that some of our let's say african science fiction or future with stories can they paint a is it the right time right now to paint a brighter future using our stories so one of the things that we found in looking at old stories there's hardly that linear way of looking at uh, futurism from past present and future it's not the way old people used to look at it back in the day it was like there wasn't past or present everything was there now and um, stories were there to educate to show about the future and teach morals and all that so um, that the way the camera now or the directors have ended up being in most films or western films or even the film that I showed the director dictates how the pace at which the film should be, what you should look at, where the show should be, and all that. So it's like the director becomes the god. But when back in the day, you'll find you when you know on a fire, or when people tell the stories, the storyteller wasn't like the owner of the story. This the community owned the story, and the storyteller was more like a curator. And so I was wondering, how can we bring these in modern storytelling? and how can technology help us in bringing or breeding that interactivity between the storyteller and the audience and how can the audience have that sense of ownership of the story so um, that's why we're doing these experiments to see how um, with theater how we can do set extensions with projection mapping or installation or how you can find tails and heads between different plots of one mediums and interact with them. So what I was talking with is that most when you go and check out lots of installations that are happening, it's quite abstract um, and it's there's hardly any um, the, the narration and also the narrations are very abstract. So we must say if you were to take this installation and put it in a street in Nairobi or somewhere just around Africa, would people consume these as stories even if they interacted? But is there any way to look at the stories and look at what's the most effective platform or medium that will help tell that particular part of the story? And if it's installation, then how can we find ways to smoothly blend between installation and maybe theater or installation and online digital? Um, how can we create mediums that transcend all these barriers that have, uh, that have been built because of marketing and all this? So, I think I don't know that it's an essential question. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your collective in Kenya? Yeah, so uh, there's no, I, I think in SA there's a, um, a quite strong collective, and but in Nairobi, because um, most of the people who are doing amazing things, you can hardly find them in like 
um, places like agencies and all those, they, they've moved away from advertising and gone away from the city to work on their own uh, projects. And so what we decided to do is to find a way that, first of all, we can have people move within a, 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 the same region. So, because I live just in the suburb outside the city, so we got these artists to move on the same street um, where we started doing other things that are not even, that's having, doesn't have anything to do with media and all. So we're doing like organic farming where we've got, we started this thing where it's like you grow where you are. So um, we find a place and then we collectively find ways to do um, the, all these stories that you are collecting from the past. There are so many things that we're finding that um, one of the things like I was told by my grandfather is try and understand the times that existed back in the day. If you're going to interpret the stories of them, understand the poetry, not the facts. And one of the things was to understand the times. And right now when you're seated on a computer working either on a game or animation and all that, times move very fast. And at these dates of things moving at Twitter, uh, things are very fast, I, I, you know, I understand. And so you find by doing something like farming, you're able to, or doing the, you're able to grow things organically at a term, at a pace at which things used to grow back in the day. And there was, I don't know whether it makes sense, but every time we meet in these places, in these gardens, and talk about ideas and things that used to happen in the past, we find it's like you're in that time, in a way, when you discuss the poetry that used to happen uh, at that time, and when you sit together, maybe go make food and all, or cook and all, you're able to discuss things other than sitting down and say, let's come up with a project. You organically discuss different ideas. And now what you wanted is to create a platform where now we can showcase what we've been discussing. And so this installation that we'll be doing will be a way where no one, no one will be there saying, I'm the director of it. But everyone will come in and put in what I think um, they've been learning from whatever guys that mean. The guys who are in gaming, the people who are in animation, the people who are comic artists, but finding a way that you can create a story that um, everyone finds their own way of presenting that is what the collective is all about. Yeah. How, can, how can the collective sustain? So that, through, through uh, commercial work? Or? Yeah, so what they do, everyone has their own job that they do on the side. So the guys who are doing comic, uh, they're doing their own comic uh, streets on on, uh, on Gazette. And then there are also like myself where I do commercial or directing or documentaries. The other people who are doing um, the guys who are doing gaming are doing a lot of architectural visualizations. And because when you do a game in Nairobi you need first of all they just learn the first game but um, there's still there's no audience in terms of the people who play but if it's something that's not as good as what they're playing at home they won't have as much interest. So you have, that's why we're, we're looking at how can we incorporate game in a different sense, like something in a different way. And people love theater there. So, and theater is more interactive and um, it's something that guys are used to. And the kind of theater that you want to do is public theater, where instead of coming into a place where, again, you're looking at the performer and seated on the side, we're trying to come up with a theater where the theater is in the middle and it's almost like a boxing ring type of thing where um, the actors also are part of the audience or they come from the audience and also, yeah. Do you know Christoph Schlingensief? Say that? Do you know Christoph Schlingensief? No. He did exactly something like that, you know, something where he's coming into the public and doing something totally crazy for the time, but it was really on the time, it was really now, it was uh, kind of talking about the problematic things, you know. He's, he's a theater director, he did films and a lot of cool stuff. He's born, uh, he's from Berlin, now he's dead. Um, but I mean, you really have to, you have to look at his stuff, what he's doing, or, or what he did, and it's because this is a really amazing inspiration, especially when you want to go to this way, with performance and being in public space, because he's, he's very political. But in a way, also funny and reflecting, and I don't know. It's, 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 it's I think he's a very good uh, example for what we want to do. Oh, thanks. I look at. Who is there any more questions? Oh. Um, have you ever thought about uh, 
you got plans to do more narrative work, like straight stuff like the like the short form? Yes. Yeah. Cool. We're doing a sequel yeah. sequel of this one. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't figured out the name. Even this name we figured out when we were about to. I just wanted to check, in terms of production, with that film you made, like, was a lot of it hitting your camera type of stuff? Or, like, because the reaction seemed very real from a lot of the people. Um, and I just wanted to sort of, to, just out of interest, to find out, like, how much of that, how did you guys go about that process? Like, did you need the kids to sort of, interact with people around him and you guys were sort of not there or was anybody aware that you were making this? Um, first, I would say it was my first time directing and it was the first time, that kid was his first time acting. So we had this thing that you're there for me and I'm there for, here for you. So, um, and then we shot the whole film in two days and we didn't have time for uh, most of, because we didn't have enough budget to pay the, uh, the, the DPs, we had to get different people who would come from different jobs to come and shoot a certain scene quickly. So we had two five days, and one camera was just focusing on the kid who, who we did more of a documentary style, where I was just shooting, um, following the kid, and then the other camera was just following or getting reactions. And because I knew um, what I needed to compose it on the head, was from the reactions that I'll be getting from these other people. And also, I had issues, because then I didn't know whether to put a green screen or to do um, a rotom for them. And sorry, it's a te yeah. bit technical, but I didn't know whether to do one of those. So in the edit, that's when um, I was able to figure out, um, that's when I also realized that it was a good idea to have one film, one camera shooting the, uh, the crowd, and another one just being on the kid. Kid actually wearing something weird. Yes, yeah, he was wearing um, a TV head, and but we, I could see the kid, so there wasn't anything. There was perspex, so I just got uh, normal perspex, and then I put it so that I was able to read the reactions from the kid's face, and then um, also the, with the perspex we were able to get a good reflection from like cars and all that. So it was easy to uh, compose it, to use the light, that light information to compose it, the image. Because we found if we use a green screen, when you remove the green screen, you lose a lot of things that help with that. Uh, thank you. <laughs>